All right, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Christina Lugbenyuk. I am the co-director of events at Ukraine House at Yale. Um, I had the pleasure of coordinating um, our lovely guest speakers today. Um, Ukraine House would like to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to come and listen to this very important um, and timely topic of discussion. Um, I, just before we begin with why you're all here, wanted to bring your attention to two things. Um, as most of you know, the two-year anniversary of the full-scale invasion isn't for another two days, um, so we're starting a little bit early with this event. On um, Saturday, on the 24th, we will be having a vigil um, for the two-year anniversary of the full-scale invasion at the women's table in front of Sterling Memorial Library at 1.30. Um, so we'd be very grateful if you could join us there as well. Um, we will be honoring the bravery and strength of Ukrainians um, fighting both now and unfortunately those who are not with us anymore. Um, and second, uh, we are also raising money for a fundraiser um, this semester. Um, our main goal is to provide four tactical medical backpacks, um, which are very expensive. Um, so if you could um, add this cause to your bucket. I know many of you are already donating to so many different causes, but we will be more than happy to take more of your money. Um, our very um, active uh, fundraising buddy, Yuri Slesuk, is heading that whole um, that whole charge, and so he will be more than happy to talk more about the specifics of that, so if you are interested, please reach out to him uh, or anyone else who you know is from Ukraine House. We are very happy to talk your ear off about that as well, and what else do I have here? Um, there are QR codes. I think he was passing out, so those are that's the easily accept, uh, accessible fundraiser link that we have, and... Now on to why you're actually here. So we have our guest speakers um, moderating our very own Professor Marcy Shore. Um, the speaker is Professor Timothy Snyder and philo Ukrainian philosopher and journalist uh, Volodymyr Yermolenko here from, where were you most recently? Kharkiv, Kherson? Kyiv. Kyiv, most recently. But he's been everywhere um, very recently, which I think all of you will get to hear about very shortly. Um, but... Uh, for, for, without further ado, I will pass on the microphone to our moderator. So join me in welcoming them. Is this working? Okay, thank you everyone for coming. And thank you for Christina um, and our students for organizing and Lubava and Christopher for bringing us Volodya, who I'm so happy to see. This is the first time we've seen each other in person since the beginning of the full-scale invasion uh, two years ago, although we've seen each other many times over Zoom um, and other various cyberspace outlets. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce um, Tim and Volodya, who you've just met, and then perhaps give you just a little bit of background and then launch into a couple questions. Um, so first is... Most of you probably know this is Tim Snyder, um, and he's a professor of history here. And he's also my husband, so I shouldn't like give a traditional academic introduction. I think you all know who he is, and it would be kind of embarrassing if I give a kind of little blurb about his CV, because it would just seem pretentious. But I think you all know who he is. Um, he's been very kind of actively in involved, as has our, our whole family in some way, in this gruesome war. Um, and, and we're both really, really happy to be here with, with Volodya. I mean, we would be still happier if we would get to be here with Volodya under more cheerful circumstances um, to talk about more cheerful topics. But um, as, as it is, we're here. So Volodya is a philosopher. Um, he studied at CEU. He studied um, at, in Paris. He functions in multiple languages. He wrote a book about Walter Benjamin. And I would love to talk about Walter Benjamin, but that is not actually today's, <laughs> today's topic. There's a lot that could be said about it. Um, he teaches at Kiev Mohila Academy, you know, and there are all these things that goes on in one's kind of, you know, ordinary academic intellectual scholarly life when, you know, mass slaughter is, is not being carried out around you. Um, but when mass slaughter is being carried out around you, then sometimes one leaps into other activities. 
Um, and and Volodya, since the very first moments, you know, has been working, you know, not only as as a, a teacher and a mentor, but also as somebody who is bringing humanitarian aid, as someone who is bringing military aid, as someone who, together with his dauntless and extremely impressive and brilliant wife, um, has been delivering um, aid to the front lines again and again. You know, who has been researching war crimes and who has been, and this may be particularly relevant for this audience, um, running also a kind of website um, it, it, journalistic service um, with a, a podcast in English called Ukraine World. Um, and the podcast is not just daily news updates. It's also been some very in-depth conversations with Ukrainians, with Americans, with people from all different countries coming from all different backgrounds, with philosophers, with journalists, with political scientists, with specialists in literature, with novelists, um, talking through what we are watching in real time and asking very serious questions about what we're learning about imperialism what we're, can we understand this psychoanalytically? Can we understand this historically? Can we understand this through literary metaphors? You know, one of the things he, he wrote fairly early after the full-scale invasion was, you know, we are, Ukraine is now, you know, the hamlet of Europe, you know, asking very literally the question of to be or, or not to be. Um, and I'll, I'll also say about Volodya, one of the things I found especially inspiring about him is that yeah, on, on February 24th, uh, two years ago, which in fact here was February 23rd because, as you know, four in the morning in Kiev is, is actually nine in the evening, our time. So I remember it as being nine in the evening. Um, and I'm not even Ukrainian, and um, I was on the other side of the world, and I felt like I was in a state of general paralysis and couldn't really imagine what I was going to do or what I was going to say, or I felt like, I kind of felt like I did being in New York on September 11th, this sense of you're just waiting for the rest of the world to blow up. Um, and my thought was, of course, of, of my friends and colleagues in Ukraine, and was I ever going to see them again, and, and where were they, and who was in a bomb shelter, and who was going to survive, and the thought of asking them or continuing any kind of normal activities like various and sundry conferences or Zoom seminars or whatever the things were we had planned seemed kind of inconceivable to me because people were fighting for their lives. And Volodya was one of the very first people who struck me as not being paralyzed, you know, and who immediately was like, no, no, we're going to do the seminar. <laughs> like, no, we're still going to have this conversation. Like, no, well, unfortunately, I have to, like, you know, drive my kids to the safer place, but then I'm going to come back, you know, you know, and um, we'll record a conversation about this, and then we're going to talk to that person. You know, and I was kind of blown away um, by both Volodya and by, by Tanya and the conversations they were having that were so incredibly lucid. Um, uncannily lucid, you know, at, at a moment of extremity and the possibility that, that you can both kind of fight for survival and think very intensely, you know, at, at the same time was something extraordinary. Um, and uh, so I'm very, very happy that we have him here in, in person. Um, we can talk about philosophy, we can talk about resistance. We can talk about what it means to fight a war just some 48 hours ago or so. You know, Volodya was, you know, was out in eastern Ukraine and now he is here um, in this surreal world we live in. And I'm going to start off by throwing a question to both of you because, again, I remember I'm now thinking about the conversations we had in those at the end of February two years ago when I was just amazed that you were capable of having conversation at all because I was barely capable of having a conversation and I wasn't even in Ukraine. Um, how, how do you see what is happening now differently from the way it felt two years ago? What can you, I'm thinking of Hegel's famous line about the owl of Minerva that spreads its wings only with the dawning of the dusk. What do you see more clearly now about February 2022, um, and how is that then influencing how you're processing the present moment?
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marcy. It's, uh, I'm very touched by this introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you both Mar Marcy and, and team for, uh, for this event and, and thank you to wonderful, to Christina and to wonderful, uh, community, Ukrainian community here at Yale. I'm so impressed with your, uh, with your energy and thank you for Christopher and, uh, and, uh, uh for, uh, um, uh, for helping, uh, with this visit and Lubawa. Uh, I'm, I'm at the first time at Yale, so it's, it's, it's also a great, great interest and, and great pleasure. So I, I actually disagree a little bit um, with you, Marcy, about the capacity to speak. I think we were all, we were all blocked. And uh, the fact that I immediately started with my wife, my wife doing the podcasts in English, like very, very intensely um, at Ukraine World, like every day, it was also, it was not out of the fact that we are well, filled with words. It was also about the fact that we are empty at words. We were, it was an attempt to not to be silent, to overcome this silence. And I remember uh, when we first came to Kharkiv, it was June 2022. So uh, Kharkiv region was not still liberated. We met with Kharkiv uh, people, with Jadan and uh, other folks and uh, I remember Jadan said uh, when he was asked whether he's writing something, he said, uh, I'm not writing anything. I'm not writing any poetry, any prose. So I know that this is changed with him and this is changed with all of us. So this period of uh, complete silence and lack of words, lack of expression means it was with us, of course, because the reality around us was so, so deep, so uh, tragic, so painful that actually no words could match it. Then we understood that this is not the case. And um, the book that we are now writing with my wife, it will probably be called Beyond Silence. I still, I, I'm still not sure about the title. But this, um, it, it is also a metaphor about Ukrainian culture that is, has been overcoming this incapacity to speak. And the way how it speaks now, uh, it, it's very interesting and very deep. Because you mentioned Walter Benjamin, and uh, I mean, it's, it's a different story when you think about people like Walter Benjamin in a peaceful times, and when you think about him in, in, uh, during the war. And uh, I personally think that lots of his metaphors, and he was really, you know, uh, working in the dark times. And remember, I was asking you, about your advice about this series that that uh, we actually launched with with team in September 2022, this series Thinking in Dark Times, that it echoes Hannah Arendt's a metaphor. So I do think that um, it, it it always a matter how you 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 go to a very different regime of of thinking and and speaking. It's not a Postmodernist regime, uh, when you see abundance of words and abundance of culture and abundance of texts, which which you you know play dialogue, uh, have a conversation, you're actually in a completely different situation, which is probably the Adamic situation when you actually invent words, you invent names, you you, you try to name the reality, and therefore uh, I I think that as I'm representative also of Ukrainian culture and a writer's community from Penn Ukraine, I, I see, so majority of Ukrainian writers are my very close friends, and I see how they create, how they overcome this. The poetry, the Ukrainian poetry, um, I brought you, by the way, a book of Ukrainian poetry. Uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing in the way how it's it's beyond literature. It's not, it's not you 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 do not really find, you cannot really find the word for it. So it's it's like goes from the depth of experience from the earth, um, and um, I do think that it's it's a it's a big question of uh, of culture that at some moment the war of course is against any culture but if you look at it from a different perspective you can see that when life meets death in, in a very very uh, direct 
encounter, it is producing something very valuable. And therefore, I'm saying that Ukrainian culture now and those cultures that are going through these difficult periods, look at them, look at them around the world, and uh, they really bring something valuable. So I'm, sp I'm talking a lot without answering your question. Now let me address very briefly to it. Um, I don't think that I look at it uh, differently. I didn't have any big illusions about quick Ukrainian victory. Uh, I, was, I remember we were going to France in late 2022 or somewhere, and it was just after this first counteroffensive, and our friends in Paris was, were asking us, okay, so next year in Bakhchi or something like that. And we were selling, telling them, like, prepared, be prepared that this will be a war that will take decades. That, um, that actually the Ukrainian question in the 21st century will be as important as, let's say, Polish question for the 20th century. Uh, so I do think that we need to be prepared for that. And uh, um, always people ask us about exhaustion in, in Ukraine, about fatigue. I have the impression that people in the West have more fatigue than Ukrainians. Uh, I, frankly speaking, uh, for you to understand, what, what, what day we are now? It's Thursday? Uh, Thursday or Friday? I just I lost a little bit. But on Monday I was in Kherson. Uh, this is one of the most dangerous cities in Ukraine right now. So Kherson, uh, the only oblast center that was uh, under Russian occupation, it was liberated by Ukrainians in November 22. But then, I mean, can you imagine just the, how people are going through it? So eight months of occupation, including deportations, including uh, torture, torture chambers, including uh, very bad things. Then liberation, and Russians are just across the river at some places, one kilometer, at some places, five kilometers. If you go to, close to the Dnipro River, uh, at least in December 22, when we were there for the first time, you, you, you can be killed by a sniper. You can go uh, close to the Dnipro River, and the 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 um, the districts are practically empty. There is practically no people. There is artillery shelling, and there is drones um, every day. And uh, and then there was the explosion of Kachovka Dam, and the city was flood flooded. And at some um, districts, uh, the water was up to the second floor. And it, it was standing there, like the whole quarters, it was standing there for the several weeks. So can you imagine people who are living there, what, what difficulties they, they went through? Occupation, regular shelling, flood. But despite that, these people who, are, who we meet there are full of energy. They are making expositions, they are making, they are collecting books for the library, they are doing some uh, some work and they don't give up. They they realize that their situation is very very difficult, but you cannot hear from them. Oh, they 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 are people with, with a lot of dignity. Um, another story I can tell you that uh, in one of the villages that we visit regularly, it's the village called Kamyanka. It's on the way from Izum to Slavyansk for Ukrainians for you to understand the geography, it's Kharkiv region, and it's completely destroyed. So there were very heavy fights there. There is like several hundreds of houses, and uh, nothing is without destruction. So we come there to one family regularly, and the first time we came to them, and we understand that they are living in practically in ruins, I was just trying to give them some money, and the man with lots of dignity refused. I mean, these are people living in ruins without any money, and he refused. And then we, we started bringing them some you know, practical, like generator, fuel for generator. Whatever. Every time I'm asking them, what do you need that we bring? He says, no, I'm fine, it's, it's, it's fine, it's okay. We, we are coping with it, don't worry. And they are more like waiting for us because they want to talk and just to give us a cup of coffee and to smile and to joke and whatever than to get, get something from us. So I think this dignity of the of very ordinary people is something remarkable. And um, 
of course, when Marcy, you were saying about what we were doing, we were doing just very modest things. The really the heroic deed of many many Ukrainians who came to the uh, who sub, who came to the army and many of them are now not alive. Um, this is uh, this is something extraordinary, and I always say that this war is about ordinary people making extraordinary things, and I think this is one of the most the biggest lesson. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Volodya, first of all, for, for being here, and thanks to everybody uh, for joining us. This is, I think, the third, in a way, public conversation we've had during the war, but it's the, it's the first one not in Ukraine, and so I'm, I'm very glad you can be with us. And I, I certainly share the view and the experience that the most remarkable interactions during this war have been unmediated conversations with previously unknown people and uh it's i was um i'll just make a i'll make a i'll make one philosophical point and trying to answer marcy's question about what what one learned or what one had wrong i was uh, during the during the time of the war i've been trying to to finish a book which is about freedom and I, I took that book with me, as Volodya knows very well, because I have burdened him with it in various ways. He's been forced to read it and to talk about it in private and to talk about it in public. Um, poor man. Uh, but it's, um, it, 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 it meditates on what it would mean to have a freedom which was positive rather than negative. So a freedom which isn't just about the absence of things, but about the presence of things. And being in deoccupied territories of Ukraine, like Kherson Oblast, has been helpful and very helpful in thinking about this for me, because I, I, I really like the I really like the word deoccupied. So deoccupation is, of course, something we wouldn't have thought about in 2022 when the war began, but now there is a fair amount of Ukrainian territory, as Volodya says, which was first occupied and then deoccupied. And what I like about the word deoccupied is that it's not the word liberated. The, the word liberated has a kind of magic to it. And I understand why soldiers use it and I understand why people use it, but the word deoccupied teaches a different lesson. It teaches you that you can remove this horrible thing. You can remove this occupation. You can drive away the people who were murdering your elites and, and kidnapping your children. But that doesn't mean that you're free. Freedom is, freedom is more than that. So in the, in the, in the Anglo-Saxon or in, in the European debates about positive freedom and negative freedom, people are usually thinking about, well, to have positive freedom, you need the welfare state, you need to have trains, you need to have education. I think that's, that's all true, but it's what you actually need to be free is put very starkly when you remove all the evil and then you have to ask, okay, what is the good? What is the good? So when, when Volodya was thinking about, was talking about Herson, I was thinking about a conversation I had in, in, a, in a little town called um, Posad Pokrovske. In, in a deoccupied part of Kherson Oblast with, uh, with a lady who called herself um, Maria Mikhailivna. In my mind, she's Pani Maria because like, I have a more Polonized version of Ukrainian, so like an older lady for me is always Pani. Um, and, uh, and, and she, you know, we, we were, her, so the entire village of Posad Pokrovsky was destroyed, every single, every single building was destroyed. And she was living in a little aluminum hut and uh, and she wanted, so we were talking for a while about this and that, and she said many touching and interesting things, but like a, like, like a normal person, she wanted, me, she wanted me to see the inside of her hut because she was happy that she had everything in order, right? She had, the, she had her, she had all of her, she had a book, you know, by the bed, she had her generator, she had her bottles of water, she had her blankets neatly arranged, and she wanted me to see it, and then she, and then she asked, like, Right? Like, is everything normal? And, and that word normal is contained so much because it doesn't mean like is everything normal. It doesn't mean is everything the way that it is. 
right? Because normal in that village was all of the rubble. That was what was normal in the sense of the way that it is. But what she meant was normalno in this in the sense of normative, in the sense of following norms, in the way that in the way that things should be, right? So it should be that a house should be she should have a house and it should be in order, right? And that raises, you know, that begins the conversation of all the other things that should be so that you could have a normal, dignified life. So in her case, she was, she was over 80 years old and walked with a walker, and the rubble blocked the route from her hut to the road. And so, okay, it would be normal for her to be able to walk to the road. And then she's not going to be free until she can walk to the road. So, I mean, things things like that, like... I, I think it's been my experience that Ukrainians have been thinking very clearly and very creatively, um, surprisingly so, and we shouldn't be surprised by that because in a way, this will be my second and last point so we can move on, but in a way we shouldn't be surprised by that because it's the other side of genocide. So genocide is a very broad concept. It doesn't just mean that we're trying to kill you. That's a part of it, but it also means we're going to re-educate your children. We're going to burn your books. We're going to drive you into immigration where you'll assimilate, right? And, and so when, when we use the word culture, we might think, okay, culture, it's material culture. But culture is the way that people interact and the things that they're able to create. And so without but in any way trying to say that there's been a positive side to all of this, I'm not surprised in a way that my Ukrainian friends have been so creative. And by this, I don't just mean like the artists and the, write, and the writers who are writing, who are writing. Like Jadon has actually now written a lot since the war started, for example. But also, you know, the, the, the everyday people and the, the, the soldiers writing the poetry in the front. Because there's like survival isn't, survival isn't just biological. Survival is about showing that you exist, right? When someone says your culture doesn't exist, and therefore nothing is lost to the world if we destroy you biologically, there are different ways to answer that, and, uh, and, and those ways are visible. So those are things that I wouldn't have been able to think about in 2022, but which are just part of like normal experience now. I'll keep going with this theme of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Um, one of the ideas I've always been drawn to in philosophy has been this idea of, of the border situation. I mean, Carl Jaspers talks about the grand situation, and um, my beloved Lev Shestov, who I've been obsessing about for the past several years, you know, has a critique of reason. She feels like reason is all well and good for the middle zones of human experience for most things most of the time every day. But then there are those border zones. There are those moments of extremity. There are the places that reason can't reach, the extremes of human experience. You know, and the kind of war and violence that is happening and terror that is happening now, those are border zones. Those are gran situation. You know, that is beyond the bounds of what reason can generally reach, and that brings out things in people that they wouldn't have necessarily known about themselves. You know, from the point of view of people like Shestol and Jaspers, philosophy begins there. Philosophy begins at that point, you know, where reason doesn't reach and where we have to ask the questions that, that can't be answered. Um, so I guess I, I have two questions that I want to throw out. Um, one, what has most surprised you about what you have empirically observed about people? And kind of connected to that, has it changed you as a philosopher? Has it changed your thinking, having had this experience in your own skin? It, it definitely changed uh, because, well, the philosopher who I am right now is a philosopher who spends more time driving vehicles to the front line than sitting and reading. And uh, much more you can say this about people who are actually on the front line and uh, the soldiers who are on the front line. So it's definitely, at the same time, uh, 
I probably had the wrong uh, feeling about philosophy when I was studying at the university. I was thinking that philosophy is somebody like very similar to Hegel and standing on the cathedra. And, and no, I think it's wrong vision of philosophy. So we have Skovoroda in Ukraine, who is basically known uh, as a pop right now, a, a rock star or pop star who is moving around. So philosophy who walks actually from village to village. Uh, Mm, so I think this topic of grand situation is is very important, uh, and we are now with with Tanya. We will uh, we were asked by Book Arsenal to prepare the focus topic, and it, it's I don't know if I can announce it. No, I probably cannot because it's not officially announced. But uh, it will have the word meja in it, and meja in Ukrainian it means border, or it means grandse, or it means Margin, or it's mean borderland. What I think we are like the philosophy that is and poetry and literature, which is being born in Ukraine. It is certainly not. Uh, it, it has nothing to do, like. It, it is a, a, a big rupture with what we might call postmodernist epoch. Why? Because. First, I think postmodernism was about this opposition between the margins and the center, and how you can overcome the domination of the center by, you know, bringing the margins into the um, interest. And this is what we what we might think from Benjamin to Derrida. When you go to these lands, and I, I think Tim Tim will probably. Confirm it because I know that you went uh, this year also very close to the front line. So you actually go to these uh, territories, which are, you know, the tension increases because you 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 go to to places where life is meeting its border. It's it's um, it's 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 how to say it border. And when life meets death, and uh, in a very, very direct way, and uh, you can say that this is like Hers we, you can say that Kherson is a place where life ends, but you can also say that Kherson is a place where life begins, because it asserts itself in a situation when you can say could say that life was impossible, but still life is possible where it is impossible, and therefore it's it's a completely different thinking. Uh, which is emerges in in our culture, I think it is a statement that margins and center are not opposed to each other. Margins is the center because it 's a place where you have lungs of the society when here you have its blood system in a way and um, I think this is this is this is very very important, and therefore i 'm asking myself why uh, why people come to Ukraine? Why people from the outside come to Ukraine? Because if you're living in the United States, you probably have the impression that, you know, the first, the, I mean, the, the very first second you cross the Ukrainian border, you will be shelled by rockets and you will die in the fifth minute. Which is not the case, of course. I mean, Kyiv is a vibrant city. Kharkiv, 40 kilometers from the Russian border, is a vibrant city. Lots of people, lots of things going on. Uh, and and all all the other places. Yes, occasionally you can have missile strikes, um, but well, this is what life is about. And, uh, of course, the closer you go to the front line, the different, uh, the more different it is. But when I'm asking my qu this question, and I I continue these talks with the foreigners who come, and it's very interesting because this is a, this is also a very interesting experience and very valuable. Uh, I feel that they're seeking for something that they lack in their countries. And this search is the search of authenticity. This is what people seek when, you, when they come to Ukraine. And this is what me seeks uh, while I'm living in Kiev, a Kiev suburb. And I, I can tell you that I cannot really leave for a long time without going to the front line, without bringing something. And uh, it's it's about my duty as a citizen, but it's also about my feeling, internal feeling. Because people seek authenticity. And uh, people living closer to these existential situations are, in a way, more authentic. 
And uh, I know in, in our postmodern era, it, the, the word authentic sounds very weird and you can be suspicious about. But frankly speaking, this is, this is, this is, this is the metaphor that comes into, my, into our mind. Uh, one soldier just recently tells us that he's a, a guy who lost his hand. He drove us from, uh, we came to the uh, places nine, six, nine kilometers from the front line to the villages in the south. Uh, and uh, we brought them two cars. And then as we came to them in two cars, he needed to drive us back to Dnipro. Uh, he has only one hand, he lost his hand in summer. Despite that, he drives this car 40 kilometers per hour, talks on the phone, smokes, and, <clears throat> and doing lots of other things. So it was, it was more scary to be with him in the car than to be six kilometers from the Russian troops. Uh, but uh, he's, a, he's a very, very nice person who actually was caring about forests in Mariupol. And uh, lots of people you see on uh, this engaged are actually lost their homes to the Russian invasion. So, and he was telling us, look, in this situation, well, he, he used the idiomatic expression, which I cannot say this in publicly because it is an idiomatic expression, but generally the meaning in the, it was that it's not a place to play. So this situation just shows who you are. And uh, maybe, maybe this, what Jaspers or some other people were talking when they were talking about this grand situation. Just a couple, a couple related thoughts, just returning to some of Wolodzie's themes. I, 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 so I, I really never liked the idea of, of liminality I really know, like lim this, I think because it hit me, you know, when I was a teenager, the the, the French post-structuralism and like the liminality was such a cliche and like right in front of my face and I couldn't really bear it. And so I've, n I've never really liked the idea of liminality. I've never really liked the idea that we should be talking around the idea of borders. And I think uh, this is one place where I've definitely changed my views. And I think, like, how you feel about liminality, like what, what Marcy's, Glenn's situation, situations around a board, bordering situations, situations where you're facing a threshold. I think how you think about that notion depends upon, and again, I think I may be restating a point that Velodia has already made, but I think it depends upon what borders you've actually been confronted with. So I think Glenn's situation and liminality is, is abstract or it only makes sense to you in relation to the borders you've actually come close to. And so it's, it's, it, it, and so there is, there is, there, there's a value, I guess that's like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, there's a, there's a concreteness in that notion, which I hadn't really appreciated until I had some contact with different kinds of, of borders. And I'll just, I'll just leave it at that on the, on the, um, there's a couple other things I wanted to say, like on um, on postmodernity and authenticity. I, I think you know we were talking about Ukraine, but I can't help but mention the contrast with um, with the practical political philosophy of of the Russian elite, which I find very you know which I find very significant i think it matters in terms of what actually happens in the world because the like when when Volodya, and you can correct me you know but when Volodya's is talking about authenticity and exchanges extraordinary things by ordinary people it's a kind of version of distributed truth like there's a little truth there in that village and there's a little truth there in that experience and you go out and you find it and like it's kind of in clumps you know there's something there there's something there there's something there there's something in that song there's something in that book there's something in, in that person's story of what happened in Mariupol or in Kherson but we're accepting that there's truth you know we're accepting that there's truth that may not be easy it may not be unified it's very human you tend to get better at learning it when you're listening to other people that kind of notion 
And the Russian notion is really different. I mean, the official one, but I think it's also a social one, which says that something like, there's no truth at all, right? There's no truth at all. Nothing's really true. There are no empirical truths. There are also, there are also no ontological truths. There are no ethical truths. There isn't truth about what is. There isn't truth about what should be. There just isn't really any truth. And that's bad enough, but I think it's also not the whole story. Because what we observe, and this is also something that you can kind of pick up in the last two years, is that all of these, like all of these wannabe nihilists, at the end of the day, they do have something they believe in. But it's not a very reasonable thing because it hasn't been tested on other people. It hasn't been distributed. It hasn't been aired out in the world. And so what I mean is that these, these people who claim to believe nothing they turn out to believe one thing and it's incredibly naive and stupid and dangerous. So Putin, for example, you know, he spends 99% of his time telling us that everything is false, the West is false, it's all hypocrisy, right? Only power matters, the universe is empty of all value. Except when he's telling you that it really is true that Russia has existed since 862 in an unbroken, you know, beautiful con continuity, which is a completely ridiculous idea, right? Like it's childishly stupid. I would be ashamed if, I mean, I would honestly be ashamed if an elementary school child believed something like that. And my point is you can only believe those incredibly stupid things because you claim there's no truth, right? Because since you claim there's no truth, like you can't psychologically bear there's no truth, and so you end up believing in one really stupid thing. But beyond that, you're just out of practice. You know, you don't listen. You're, you, you, give, you give monologues. And I just wanted to mention that as another fruit of a kind of postmodernity, like the postmodernity that, that denies that there is any truth, that like something that you notice is that people do end up believing things. It's just the things that, that they believe are crazy. And this is part, and this is, a, I think this is an integral part of this war. I think it's the part of the essence of this war. It's not just a curiosity. So there's a confrontation in why people are fighting, which I think reveals also a difference in how people are thinking. Uh, okay, I'm realizing that you know the three of us could go on talking about postmodernity and liminality for a long time, and there are all these bright young students here who might also have other questions, perhaps non-philosophical and uh, more practical ones. So I think we should open to the audience, and maybe Christina, can I ask you to take one of these microphones, and we'll we'll expose Volodya to the questions of our students. <laughs> Oh, yes, and please introduce yourselves when you ask a question. It just stand up and smile. And... Hello, um, my name is Andre Fao also. Um, I'm here on the behalf of the Yale Daily News, so I'm going to write a nice little article about um, the, speak, the speaking session. Um, thank you so much for, for coming such a long way to talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, in light of the second anniversary of the full-scale invasion, um, what ought to be served as a reminder to the student body and just the general population who may not be talking about the war as much, where the public discourse has kind of faded away because it's been such a long and extended fight? Okay. Chris, could you, could you rephrase that a little bit more tightly? You didn't catch the whole question. Well, like, so I'm, in the lead-up to the second anniversary... I've, just in terms of campus discourse and in terms of general public discourse, it feels like the war maybe to, for some people was not at front of mind. What do you want people to be reminded about when it comes to both the human cost but just the general situation as it stands now in the conflict? Yeah, I think it's very 
because we we don't really hear uh, the sound goes there and look i think that the first thing is that ukrainians are not going to surrender and uh, this is the message that i bring all the time uh, that you you cannot believe how much exhaustion is of course in ukraine i mean we, we cannot deny this fact i mean Imagine a, a ordinary civilian guy who went to the front line and is already for two years, some of them ten years already. So let's 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 not forget that the war started in twenty fourteen. So you just pulled away from the ordinary life with just very little things that we're all accustomed to. I mean, take the, the shower or go see your family. Imagine so many people that just don't see their children. Or even to much, uh, of course, much more painful situation when you lose your friends, when you when you lose part of your body. I mean, you, you can't you cannot you cannot say that this is normal, and then Ukrainians are people in steel, and they will be, you know, let them fight, and we will just observe them. No, it's it, we are just normal people, right? But despite this fact, I don't see any mood in the Ukrainian society that, yeah, but we are tired, we're not going to fight back. So this spirit is there, and I want everybody to, to understand that it is there, but we also need to realize that, I mean, Russia is enormously bigger enemy with much bigger resources than us, that is going not only the, the war killing people, but is going in the, in the way of economic war. Uh, destroying our enterprises, closing the ways to export, etc., etc. So, of course, we Ukrainians will fight, but they need and we need support from Europe, from America, from Asia, from all these uh, countries which are considered that uh, this is important. But when I'm asked, like, what, what is, why we should care about Ukraine, uh, and this is a very important also uh, a question that we also need to think about. And my response to you here in America is rather related to what Tim, Tim was saying about normality. And I think we need to really care about this because the normality is changing. The way how Russia behaves right now, it's changing the normality all over the world. And I think the key normality, which I mean, is that violence is bad. The idea that violence is bad is more or less present, I believe, in uh, what we might call the post-World War II world. Of course, it's not present everywhere. It's hypocritical. We all understand that. But I think the, the basis of, of the international order after the Second World War was the idea that violence is bad. And Russia is changing that. Putin is changing that. Because Russian society and Putinist Russia is a society. And I, I personally, the Ukrainians who lived in the Soviet Union through the 90s, we, we kind of understand it physically on our everyday experience. And all our story from the independence was a story how can we go away from the system of society where violence is not bad, when it's considered as the argument of the last, of the, of the, of the good, of the best argument. So the problem uh, with Russia is that Putin is the, is the hair of those people. So Putin is a KGB, right? KGB is NKVD, Cheka, all those people who are killing people in mass in 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, uh, without any tribunals, without any trials, and they are saying we have won. They are saying our approach to society has won, and our approach is no justice, no law, just pure violence. So in a, in a way you can see Russian invasion of Ukraine also as a collapse of the idea in Russia that you can solve Russian problems through non-violent uh, things, including soft power, propaganda, uh, cultural influences, whatever, whatever it is. Russians just said, 
first in 2014 and then in 2022, that nothing works. L Russian influence in the world doesn't work. The only thing that works is violence. And when we come to this normality, to this new normality, the problems will be everywhere. I, for me, the very illuminating thing is to talk, for example, not with Americans or Europeans, but from people uh, to people from the other continents. I have good friends in, in Latin America who say, who tell me that, yeah, we look with a, with a big worry about what is going on because the very idea of Latin America is built upon the idea that you cannot violate borders. Like if you apply the idea of Russian world to the Latin America saying that everywhere where people uh, speak the same languages should be you know, the same state and the same Tsar, it will be collapse of the whole continent. And I, I do think that if we go, and I, I see that in, in the United States, I, I, uh, I also see these trends, and I think these are very dangerous trends, and I see that in Europe, and I see it everywhere. Like people are saying, violence is acceptable, violence is good, we can, we can proceed, it. we can violate borders, personal borders, cultural borders, political borders, etc. That, that, that is what Putin is doing. It's not fighting for territories. He doesn't give a, can I say this word? No. About territories, uh, it's it's and therefore when you, when you talk when you see here a discussion whether we should go to negotiations or not, of course all Ukrainians want peace much more than you know, everywhere else in the world. But the problem is that the solutions that are proposed are not going to end the war, because Putin is not about territories. He is really changing this normality. So if we are going to the world in which normality means violence, we are in, in big trouble. And therefore, in order this not to happen, Putin should be stopped. Hi, uh, my name is Vitara Skivichuta. I'm first year master's student in European and Russian studies. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. And I'm a huge fan of Explaining Ukraine podcast. So my question, keeping in the Benjamin theme, I guess is about the translator's task. Because the way I see this podcast, and all of you on this panel, I think in different ways, you're engaging in this task of trying to find, try, trying to find a way of translating the experience of the Ukrainian experience, of the war experience, to the public's that are not living in those border situations, people who have no idea and no capacity sometimes even to relate or to empathize. Um, so my question would be, um, is it possible to find a pure language to translate such experience? Is it possible to release it and just somehow illuminate the people who are just living across the Atlantic or in different places for whom it might not be um, the priority? Or does it have to come from the publics and the audience themselves, the certain uh, inclination to at least try to understand? And the translator's task is, at the end, impossible. Thank you. The short answer is no. You, you cannot translate experience. Uh, but the longer answer is that all culture is about this. So all, all, everything that we call culture and art and literature is about this. It's about the old guy called Aristotle, uh, who uh, said that the, the goal of uh, theater is uh, catharsis, and catharsis, in, nine, in my modest interpretation, is not about purification of emotions, is about a capacity of a spectator to go through emotions that he or she does not experience or experienced in the past but forgot. So it's all about living a, a, an, an alternative life in a way, a different life. This is what catharsis means for me. This is the, the goal of art for me, well, one of the goals of art. And in this sense, you cannot, I mean, the words in which Ukrainians describe the most horrible things are, are, are very banal and very unemotional. For example, when, when uh, a missile uh, strikes your house, 
you say prilit, prilitilo. So someone flew to you like a bird, uh, or unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we have a very like abstract and banalized terminology for dead or wounded. So dead is dvuhsoty two hundred, wounded is trehsoty three hundred, and and this is in in the language. So I think it's it's also a way to protect yourself. Like when you when you're talking about these horrible things, you 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 use a very neutral language. But I think our task, the task of artists, the task of writers, the task of uh, philosophers, journalists, is to try to to revitalize this experience. It's it's not possible, but you can you can draw a little bit. It's like when you cry during a movie uh, about the death of a character, uh, you don't really feel the same as the death of your closest person, but you kind of come closer to it a little bit. And I think this is the task. I want to say something about that which bears on the, the previous question. Um, I think the, th there's, a, there's an experience the experience of fear is something that Ukrainians could help us process better if we listened. Because it's not, of course, that Ukrainians are superheroes or robots and don't experience fear. The, the issue is when you experience fear, what do you then do? And one of the connections between Ukraine and the U.S., I mean, the, as always happens with undergraduates, as soon as they ask their own question, they leave the room. But I'm going to hope the rest of you are interested. One of the, thing, one of the problems we have in our politics is that we assume that as soon as you're personally afraid, everything is okay. Right? If you're, afraid, if you're a little bit afraid, then naturally you withdraw you escape. And that is a, that's, if, if that is in fact what prevails in American society, we will slowly slide down into authoritarianism because there's always, there, there always is going to be a reason to fear and the politics of fear is spreading. It's, it's, it, it is directly connected to Russia, right? Like it, it, the, the Trump makes Republicans afraid and they don't know what to do with that fear except to say, of course I should surrender. Of course I should do what they want. And then that normalizes this and it institutionalizes it. And slowly our institutions become institutions of, of fear. And so that's like, that's a, an experience, um, but also, you know, a, a vocabulary. We don't have a vocabulary for that. It's like fear is on the other side of the border of politics. As soon as there's fear, politics stops and you can just do whatever you want. And if that's the attitude, then you always, then you always lose in the end. Okay. I could just add something to, to Vita's question. So Vita's from, from Lithuania. So you have experience of translation. You have experience in your daily life of what it means to live in one language, to live in another language, you know, to learn a third language. You know, and our, a, a mutual friend and colleague of ours, you know, Yurko Prohasko, who is a, a translator from Lviv, you know, likes to say everything is translation. All communication in some way is translation. You, know, you can never actually be inside of somebody else's soul. There's always some element of experience that is going to be too intimate to be communicated. But in some sense, every time we take a pen to paper, you know, every time Volodya and Tanya record a podcast, you know, every time you speak, it's a kind of act of faith that some kind of translation of experience is possible, that it's not so impossible that we give up and don't try. You know, and you have been kind of valiantly from the beginning, you know, even in situations that are impossible to translate, Trying and trying and trying. Sorry, I'll stop talking now and let Jason ask a question. Uh, hi, um, I'm Jason Stanley. I'm a philosopher here. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a difficult question about the current political moment. 
in terms of defending Ukraine. I'm 100%. I agree with everything. Putin is, you know, pure fascist, the closest to a fascist dictator since Hitler, etc., etc., etc. It's absolutely right. Ukrainians are suffering terribly. But we have a difficult political situation that has that is tough to talk to. I'm afraid of even mentioning it because if there was a panel like this about Gaza, it would be, you know, it would be a federal civil rights issue. It would be reported to the government that that at Yale University there's anti-Semitism. And uh, but we can freely talk about uh, which happened. The panel earlier in the year did get, <laughs> it is getting. Uh, and what I'm finding when I talk about, so you guys are rightly talking about the horror of Ukraine, but when I was in Ukraine, I was talking to a well-known politician who said, uh, you know who people, uh, Eastern European uh, autocrats admire? You think it's Putin. It's really Netanyahu, because <laughs> no one can understand how he gets away with it. And what I'm finding is that it's very difficult if you just in this time of horrific war, multiple horrific wars. Uh, how do we message in a way where, where all the young people can see that you can't really talk about Gaza, it's not really, you can't say the things that you said about Russia, about what's happening there. Um, how do we break through in this situation? When I talk about Ukraine, I try to get people involved and talk about the horrors that are happening there, you know, they think I'm changing, you know, they think I'm trying to avoid other horrors. And you guys are talking about violence. I mean, I'm not a historian, so I can't say, oh, I don't work on that issue. Uh, that's just, you know, historians out. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'm a philosopher. I have to think about violence everywhere. And, uh, and I have to think about what I'm not allowed to say and what I am allowed to say. But what I am getting... What the experience I'm getting in advocating for Ukraine among younger people is um, this difficulty with multiple horrifying things happening right now and this kind of impermissibility about addressing one of them in these terms. And, and I wonder how we deal with this. I'm going to take that first because I feel like Volodya is not an American and may not have all of the solutions for America and has just come from a very long, you know, on a very long ride. So I'm going to fill, I'm going to fill a couple minutes and then if Volodya wants to say something. I mean, I guess first of all, Jason, I kind of disagree with the premise that like I can't say things up here. I mean, there's nothing I wouldn't say about Gaza up here that I would say at home, you know, that I, so I, I disagree with the premise. I, I mean, I might agree that, I, I might agree that there's been a greater failure to have public discussion at Yale about uh, about Israel and Palestine. I think that's true, and I think it's a failure um, because I, I believe that it's precisely when things are at their most difficult that people should get up and you know take their punishment. Um, and I think that hasn't been the spirit here, and I think that's been a mistake. And I think we pay for it in the you know polarization of the student body and in their learning, you know, taboos, taboos from us. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I try not to think about messaging, you know. I, I think that the, the Gaza, the, the conflict in Gaza compared to Ukraine, you know, there, it, it has, it has this, it has this, there are two, there are two things which strike me as different, which you can legitimately think without, without dismissing the is the israeli war um one of them is that ukraine is simpler so you know the the russians commit you know, very roughly speaking but i think it's accurate the russians commit both the crimes of israel and the crimes of hamas they commit both the near term the decapitation the rape they do all that and they launch the missiles, and they do the indiscriminate killing. And so logically for me, that would seem that people who are concerned about Hamas and people who are concerned about Israel ought to be concerned about Russia and Ukraine. Now, that's not always the case. But 
when you look at it that way, it might seem like the double standards question points in a different direction, right? So if you care about this sort of thing, you ought to care about it in Ukraine and not just in Gaza. If you care about this sort of thing, you ought to care about it in Ukraine and not just and not just in Israel. The other difference, which I think it's legitimate to point out, is that there is a lot more one could do in the Russo-Ukrainian war because it's much closer to being a conventional military conflict where weapons will decide it. Weapons aren't going to decide the, the, the war in Gaza. There is going to be a political solution there. More, more peop, Fewer or more people will be killed along the way, and it should be fewer. But there will, there will be a political solution in Gaza of some sort. There will not be a, a military solution. Whereas in Ukraine, somebody, in fact, is going to win a war between two states. And the United States is currently doing nothing to affect the outcome one way or the other. And the United States could decisively affect the outcome should it choose. So that's a difference. And for me, like that's a reason why you would direct your energies towards the U.S. government on this issue, because we could actually change it decisively. I'm not saying our policy, by the way, towards Israel is right. I disagree with it. I'm just saying that this is a difference. No matter what we do in Israel, I hate to say it, it's not going to it's not going to solve the problem. But we could actually help the Ukrainians win the war. So anyway, if there's some further taboo you want me to break in public, I'm happy to do so. But um, those are you know those are those are my initial thoughts. And maybe Volodya wants to add something. I'm a very modest Ukrainian philosopher, so... I'd like to take advantage of being the microphone bearer, if I may, with a question. Um, I want to bring the conversation back to the humanity of Ukrainians for a sec, because the media portrayal of it tends to dehumanize in both extremes. So it's either from the Russian perspective of literally dehumanizing by the rape, by the destruction, by the torture. And the op opposite side of it is Ukrainians are superheroes. They have no ability to show any weakness. They can't show the emotion. They can't show the, the horrendous things that they are living through because they have to stay strong for us, for the West, for everybody watching. How do you humanize them? Do you have any specific stories that you use in your own, I'm sure, ample experience with the stories that you would like to share? So I don't, I don't think that uh, uh, the war is only about dehumanizing. And, and therefore, uh, I'm stressing again and again, and again that the importance of the Ukrainian art today and Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian literature. So if you, if you, if you read poems of, of Ukrainian writers today, and several of them are n no longer alive, we're talking about Victoria Melina, we're talking about Maxim Kravtsov, we are talking about people who are missing and we don't know what, 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 what is about them, like, uh, uh, like Humenuk or, or others. So in a way we are talking through their texts already, they are talking to us without the capacity to respond. But the majority of these texts is, uh, is really about about very, uh, very uh, about fragility. Uh, so n not about not about people in steel, not about knights and heroes. It's it's about fragility of human bodies, of human emotions, of uh, of the way how people go through this. So the topic of of Ukrainian program at Frankfurt uh, Buchmesse this year was. Fragility of existence. So uh, I do think that this is this is very much uh, things that we are we are thinking about, we are we are talking about. And um, I think the, the very idea that the war brings that uh, it's like coming back to like from the philosophical point of view, I, I'm much more thinking in a. I'm much more in dialogue with the authors of, of big intellectual tradition who are much lesser uh, known during the peaceful times, much lesser read, like uh, uh, like Marcy mentioned uh, Jaspers, or I would mention Pascal, 
Blaise Pascal and and his idea of a, a, a human being as a how would you say it the thinking uh, um, the okay so the I, I don't know the, the 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 word in English but it's actually thinking plant okay so something you can you can break very easily but at the same time it is thinking so it it reflects the whole universe and i think this is this is this is about it uh, one i just by memory uh, there is a very talented poet artur droin he's very young he's in early 20s and he's uh, he has a remarkable poem which i will not quote but i will rather rephrase he's talking about how he in his childish experience have seen john paul ii coming to ukraine and um, john paul ii the pope said the phrase the rain falls rain falls or is falling what is better the the rain is falling and people and and children grow up rain is falling children grow up and he rephrases it in saying soldiers are falling and kids are growing up soldiers are falling and kids are growing up so this is this is this experience and um i do think that this is this is the experience that again is 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 humanizing is enriching culture is enriching our our way how we think about human being uh, as a as a as a very very mortal and very fragile Um, hi, thank you for being here this evening. Um, I'm with Commonweal Magazine. I'm also a member of the Ukrainian Institute of America, where I think you'll be speaking on Saturday. So looking forward to seeing you there as well. Um, my question pertains to the process of decolonizing um, academic initiatives, in particular culture, history, arts. There have been quite a few initiatives undertaken by academics in the US since the full-scale invasion began, and I'm wondering if you can just say something about parallel efforts that may be underway in Ukraine, as well as um, the importance of those efforts kind of in the evolution of social change that's taking place against the backdrop of the war. Just to give you one example, uh, we went recently to one of the villages in uh, in the southern Ukraine, also very close to the front line. And just occasionally, I came into the class uh, of literature, of foreign literature class. And it's it's remarkable to see uh, that basically you can see how these schools didn't change much in the Soviet time, and foreign literature was actually the Russian literature, but just renamed into the foreign literature. So the foreign literature for, for these kids were still mostly uh, Russian literature. When there is a discussion um, in, in the West, like why Ukrainians are so angry with Pushkin status and why, why we remove the status of Pushkin, I think we need to understand that Pushkin is, uh, is a symbol, is an instrument in which the imperial power just marks its territory and says it is ours. In one of my texts, I was describing um, a Lermontov street in one of the villages um, near Kiev, which was completely destroyed by the, by the Russian invasion. And this is kind of a paradox because, of course, this village doesn't have anything to do with Lermontov. Then the next thing is the Russians come and, and destroy the street of Lermontov without, of course, thinking that it is a great Russian poet. But uh, the, the irony is that, uh, and this is what I'm saying all the time, that every naming is actually renaming and actually denaming, if I can use this, these uh, words. I, I, I don't know if, if they are... Legitimate. So, and this is the way how we, we should think about it. So, people in Kharkiv, uh, where just a week ago, the or two weeks ago, I don't remember, Pushkin Street was finally renamed into Skovoroda Street. They might be asking 
So why there is streets named after Russian literature and much less or practically inexisting named after the people who are working here in this place. So it's, it's, it's in a way coming back to the local history. The idea of local history, there is even a, a very good historical journal with this name and, uh, and very a good uh, YouTube channel. I think this is one of the very interesting things that are going on right now. And we always have this idea that, look, for Ukrainians in different regions, the best thing is to, to rediscover their history is to think about the local history. So who were born here? Who were creating here? It's also about humanization and humanizing because otherwise you're just rootless person and rootless uh, culture without understanding what has happened here. And in Kharkiv, of course, it's a, it's a very important story because basically all these people that form the Kharkiv pantheon like Hvilevi or Kurbas or Mykola Kulish or many others were exterminated in the 30s or like Hvilevi just suicided because of the Stalinist repressions. So basically you can say, okay, the central streets in Kharkiv should be the streets of Skovoroda, of Hvilevi, of Kurbas rather than Lermontov and Pushkin without the you know, discussion uh, what is the quality of Russian literature, whether it, it is imperialist or not. And I think this is this is the most important thing that is uh, that is uh, right now going on. I think in Ukraine is really a moment when there is this rediscovery uh, of of local history, of local culture, of local local literature, and understanding how big it is and how great it is and how interesting it is. Um, yeah, this is my response. And and by the way, uh, I'm sorry, I. There is another question of colonialism and imperialism. And, and I think we, we are only at the beginning of thinking about Russian uh, cultural colonialism and imperialism because, for example, the, the framework that exists in, in the West, the Saidian framework, uh, is very interesting, but it's not enough. It's not sufficient. Uh, so the Orientalist framework, for me, it's not, enough, it's not sufficient. And Mm, I think that there are several people, including myself, in Ukraine that are trying to conceptualize it. One of the ways of conceptualizing that, uh, and I expressed it many times, is that uh, Russian imperialism, while, while colonizing, when we, when we speak about, about the relations between Russians and Ukrainians, or Russians and Belarusians, while colonizing the close nations, not far away, but close um, linguistically, culturally, whatever, it's a different type of colonization because it's a type that says, uh, the, the, for example, the, the, the sea colonialism, the sea or maritime imperialism says that you are different than me, you will never become the same as me. While this Russian imperialism says you are the same as me, you will never become different than me. So the instrument of colonization is not the idea of difference, or hierarchy, it's idea of sameness. And this is what, why it is important, because we start thinking differently even about the concepts of genocide, as, as, uh, as uh, Tim mentioned, as Christopher is working on, for example. Because in this sense, well, genocide doesn't really mean that you kill everybody. Genocide means that you, uh, you exterminate the, the, the basis of the nation, like it happened with the Ukrainian peasants in the 1930s. And then you, you exterminate people who provide the thinking behind it, right? The intelligentsia, intellectuals, culture, etc. Because colonization goes through assimilation, through bringing, through artificial bringing uh, together. And, and then you have every, every, you know, Putinist discourse that Ukrainians do not exist, they're Russians, and uh, they're just deviation of Russians, and, uh, and that's it. So I, I do think that this thinking um, actually helps us better understand the causes of this war. And if we better understand the causes of this war, we also can think about the future. Because if we think that the causes of this war are just that Russia wants to take some of the Ukrainian territories where hypothetically people speak Russian, well, we don't understand anything, right? So this theoretical framework actually makes us better prepared for the future that might happen, and it is happening.
Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak um, to us today. So my name is Lena, I'm a first year, and I'm in Professor Shore's first year seminar on the war in Ukraine. So I've been stewing on this question a lot. Um, and forgive me if this is a somewhat naive question, I'm pretty new to this subject. But um, to me, the discussions with the war in Ukraine are often about like um, the agency of the Ukrainian people, the incredible um, extraordinary or extraordinariness of the ordinary people, and then also there's a lot about Putin as a totalizing authoritarian figure. And often I feel like Russian people's agency, the Russian society, is some, somewhat forgotten. And I often wonder about um, like if the antidote to Putinism lies within the Russian people in some way, or if there's any hope for some sort of grassroots movement within Russia. Um, it's a somewhat childish impulse, but who can stop Putin? What is the antidote to Putin? And um, do we know anything about the psychology of Russian people? And this is a question to both of you, because, of course, you're Ukrainian. Um, so, yeah, that is my question. I'm not, I'm not at all specialist on Russia. And therefore, my uh, thoughts are just the thoughts of, uh, of, of a Ukrainian, with, with, of course, with a certain bias. And I, I do, th I do think that. So, first thing, uh, I, I don't think the narrative that there is a bad Putin and uh, there is potentially good democratic Russian society. I don't think it's it's accurate, because we really need to see in the uh, in the history of Russian political thought, in the history of Russian politics, political culture. And unfortunately, we don't. We, we, we see rather this authoritarian uh, paradigm. We don't see any big uh, foundations for, let's say, liberal or democratic order. That doesn't mean that it's hopeless. I I do hope. Well, otherwise, uh, it's it, it it will all be only just endless war. I do hope that things might change, but I do think that the work should be done much deeper, much more decisive in the Russian society, among the Russian intellectuals, etc. They need to under, they need to say, okay, we we need to have an alternative concept of Russia. And which will be not imperialist concept, which will not be Russia as an empire. Which should be Russia as a nation state. Well Russia as a nation state, what does it mean? Should it keep its borders? Should it be uh, a different size. If we look at the classics of political philosophy from Montesquieu to Rousseau, everybody was skeptical about the potential of, of having a republic or democracy on such a big territory. I don't see these questions arising. I, I, I'm, I, I don't say among all, all Russians, but mostly I don't, I, don't, I don't see these questions taken very seriously. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm wrong. And of course, there is a question of, of military fight, and uh, we understand that well. Many things depend on whether there is that there is process in Russia, Russia itself, and whether there is the opposition, uh, including the much more decisive opposition within the Russian society. We know that there are certain units uh, which are fighting on the Ukrainian side, and this is of course very good. But they are not decisive; they are quite small actually, and um, so far.